We are ready now to discuss week six of our enterprise information modeling course. This week, we'll be talking about database design. Now, up to this point, we have looked at SQL. That is, once a database has been designed and populated with data, we looked at mechanisms for retrieving all kinds of information from the stored data. Of course, that would not be possible unless somebody has already designed the database and populated the data in it. So the design, of course, is the somewhat more challenging aspect of database design. It gets a little bit, uh, little bit abstract, and that's the topic we'll be discussing uh, the next two weeks, perhaps three. So again, to recap our overall structure of the course, you've got a user. User is using a browser, and through the browser, through the internet, the user's request in interacting with a web browser goes to a server computer. And the server computer then does the business processing. And as part of the processing, it has to retrieve information from the database. And we already know that it uses SQL to achieve this, to retrieve information from the database. And of course, as I've just pointed out, the database itself has been designed and populated with information. And the database design has been carried out by the database design. Okay, so so far we have looked at the highlight area, which is how we use SQL to get information out of a database, structured query language to get information out of a database. But now it's time for us to look at how was that database designed in the first place. Okay, so that's what we'll be looking at this week, the next week, and perhaps one more week. Okay. So we've already looked at some databases, and we looked at the table structure of several of these databases. For example, the, the first database we started with was our supplier parts projects database, and it had four tables, suppliers, parts, projects, and shipments. Each of those tables had the columns that are shown here. Suppliers, for example, had supplier number, supplier name, status, and city, and so on. Okay, now once the database structure is given to us like this. And once we have a database that is populated with data, that is every table has data, then we know how to use SQL to pull out pretty much anything from it. In fact, by now you're probably convinced that even with the limited number of features that you have learned about SQL, you can get out pretty useful information even from pretty large databases. But of course, how did somebody arrive at this particular design for the database? Why not some other design? How did they figure out that these are the tables they want to keep? And these are the columns to have in each of those tables. That's the part that uh, that is the result of the exercise of database design. Now, what we are going to do is to take a look at how you walk into a business situation. right? So some organization is running. Let's say they want to build a computer-based system for inventory management or a computer-based system for financial accounting or whatever, right? How does somebody walk into that situation, talk to the various people, gather the necessary information, and then say, you need to keep data in these kinds of tables, right? So that's the act of database design, and that's what we're going to learn now. We've also looked at the college database where we had courses, instructors, sections, students, and registrations. We did some SQL around this. Then, of course, we started off, in fact, the course with our basketball database, which had six tables, coaches, players, teams, venues, games, participations. And from each one of these databases, we were able to extract useful information. Again, as I've stressed a couple of times, at the time, whoever did the database design, designed the database, decided on the tables, at that time, they didn't really have to think about what are the various pieces of information we are going to have to retrieve from the database? That's the beauty of relational databases, that you just say, let me understand the business and model our understanding of the business in the form of tables. And then it doesn't matter what query you throw against the database, it can always be answered using SQL. Of course, there are some kinds of queries which can be answered by using SQL, but pretty much whatever we need can be answered by SQL. And in fact, uh, all the various flavors of SQL have certain extensions that can pretty much answer anything we want. So that's the beauty of database design. And the reason I'm stressing that is 
that database design is all about understanding business. Of course, you do need to understand some concepts of database design, but that's just, I would almost say that is uh, the easy part. The tough part is understanding the business and codifying your understanding. So those are all the things that we have looked at. Of course, this database, I'd just like to point out, as I've already pointed out in the first uh, class, that this database has some redundancy. You know, for example, we said uh, the team has a home venue ID, right? So here, it's enough. If you have the venue ID and the first team ID and second team ID, you can always figure out which was the home team that played in that particular game. But just for convenience, I kept a separate field called home team ID just to make it convenient. Okay, some of the queries become easier if you do this. If you had uh, the, the pure design, then the queries are not that easy. Okay, so this has got redundancy. Another form of redundancy is uh, it has to deal with the points, right? Because we know the points that every player scored in every game. So from this, technically, we should be able to calculate how many points the first team scored and the second team scored. So once again, that is redundancy in this database. Okay, redundancy has certain disadvantages, but many times in real life systems, you will see that they practice controlled redundancy so that querying the database becomes easier. So you could think of what I've done here as just controlled redundancy inside the database. In this course, we're not going to talk too much about redundancy any further, but I just want to point out that this database actually has redundancy, that some information is stored actually in multiple ways, which could be avoided. Okay, so again, as I pointed out, what we are trying to do is to understand the business rules and follow a systematic procedure, which will then lead us to the database design. Let's then get started right away with database design. Here's a table that we have looked at before, the courses table. And we know that this table had three columns, the course ID, the course name, and the number of credits for the course. Now, just some concepts before we get into um, the database design aspect is that we already know that in every table, we'll have one field or more fields actually, which are the primary key for the table. So in this table, course ID is a unique column in the sense that every row of the table has a different value for course ID. And course ID is what uniquely identifies a course. Because it is possible that multiple courses may have the same name. And therefore, in order to distinguish between two courses, you have to provide something that is unique. We already know this. For example, social security numbers are the ones that uniquely identify people in the United States. Or in Seton Hall, the Seton Hall University shoe ID, every student has a unique shoe ID, which is what uniquely identifies a person. The name by itself may not uniquely identify a person. Right? So in a relational database setting, we need to have in every table a unique identifier or the primary key for every table. Okay, and two different rows are not within the table are not allowed to have the same value for the primary key. Okay, so you've got a primary key field. And of course, there are lots of other attributes or columns inside every table. Okay, now when we talk about database design, of course, our ultimate goal is to arrive at a set of tables, but we don't start off from tables. Instead, what we try to say is, well, in this scenario, there are lots of courses, okay? So course becomes a concept that the application has, right? So the table, what results in the table is actually what we call as an entity in database design. In fact, what we are going to be learning is a technique called entity relationship diagramming, right? So for database design, what we will do first is to draw an entity relationship diagram based on our understanding of the business situation and then convert the entity relationship diagram into a set of tables, okay? And in, in the relationship between entity relationship diagrams and tables, you have things called entities. 
And as you can already see, entities have a correspondence with tables. Every entity we create will become a table in the final design. Okay, so here, this course table might have resulted from an entity that we create called course. And in entity relationship diagramming, we represent an entity by a rectangle or a rounded rectangle. And of course, every entity has a name. So this entity is the course name. And of course, for since an entity is going to become a table, we need some way to represent the various attributes or columns in the table. Okay, so in every entity, you have a bunch of attributes. There is a primary key attribute that the entity has. And in this case, the primary key we have called it as course ID, which of course became the column course ID later on. And the fact that course ID is the primary key is indicated by this hash sign. Okay, the course also has a course name. So we indicate that as another attribute. And then it has the number of credits. We indicate that by another attribute. Okay, the hash, the star, and the O are things that I'll be talking about in the next slide. Important point to note is that entities we always name with a singular name. Okay, course. We didn't say courses. Whereas in the table, we might call it uh, in plural courses. People follow different conventions. Some people follow singular naming of tables. Some people follow plural naming of tables. Uh, but that's just a matter of preference. But in an entity relationship diagram, we always represent entities in singular. An entity is a singular noun. Okay, that is something that you have to remember. Because you have to think of the entity as sort of a representative of a typical entity of that type. Okay, so that's the example of the course entity. As we've already seen, I've just drawn the course entity here. Uh, you're seeing here that the course has the course ID, which is the primary key. And hash is what indicates that something is a primary key or an identifier. Okay, The star indicates that the particular attribute is a required attribute. That means that I cannot create a course and leave the course name blank. It's a required attribute. Of course, by now you might have guessed that O stands for an optional attribute. That means I can create a course and leave the credits blank. Okay, That's what this says. Now, you may say, well, which is correct? Uh, is it correct to leave it blank or do you have to specify it? That depends on the business situation. If in the company they can, they can say, well, this is optional. Sometimes we enter it, sometimes we don't enter it, then you say it's optional. Whereas some other company or some other university may say, no, when you create a course, you have to specify the number of credits. Then we'll say it's not optional. Okay, It is mandatory. And of course, I've just shown a star here to indicate some other attribute. It's blank. Uh, I've not shown it. I should have given a name here, but I have not done that. Okay. So uh, an entity is shown by a rectangle. Name of the entity is on top. And the various attributes are listed. And for every attribute, we indicate by some initial character what sort of attribute it is. Is it a primary key? Is it a required attribute? Is it an optional attribute? And so on. Okay, so that's the course entity. Sometimes when we draw entity relationship diagrams, if we want to avoid showing too many details, we may not show the attributes. Right? Suppose you've got an entity relationship diagram in which you're showing 10 entities. Then it becomes very crowded to show all the entities as well as all the attributes. The diagram will become so crowded that people won't be able to make sense of it. So sometimes if our goal is just to show the entities and the relationships that connect the various entities, then we might not show the attributes. Okay, so both both approaches are acceptable. Okay, so here I'm showing course ID, course name, credits, all the three things. Technically speaking, course here is actually an entity type. Right? Course represents a type. It's a category. It's not because this rectangle does not represent any specific course. Right? It doesn't represent the business information modeling course. It doesn't represent uh, the management information systems course. This just says this is a representative. It's a category. It just represents all courses. It represents the family of object called courses. Okay, In that sense, an entity type is a little bit more abstract than a specific instance of an entity. Okay. So an instance of an entity is a particular course. For example, course number 30 from our 
course table with whose name is race conflict and conflict resolution and which is four credits okay so this represents a particular course which is an entity instance whereas this represents the general concept or category of a course okay so it says there is in our application something called course and every course has these three attributes okay every course has a course id every course has a course name a course can have course credits and that's all it says every particular course then has its own values for these attributes this course has a course id of 30 course name of this and the number of credits this okay so that's what we mean by the distinction between entity types and entity instances in database design we are really concerned about entity types right because instances of entities will keep on being created destroyed and so on as the application is actually used okay so for example if you're a university you'll have courses you'll have sections every semester there may be new courses there may be new sections that the instances keep coming and going but the concept of a course will continue to stay on so in database design we are much more interested in the concepts or categories than in actual instances okay so you can see here the connection between the uh, between the attributes shown in the entity type and the actual values of those attributes in specific entity instances so we'll be learning how to draw entity relationship diagrams and in an entity relationship diagram the word entity actually refers to entity types not specific instances right so we want to look at a situation a business situation or an organizational situation and we want to identify the various entity types in that situation for example if you're talking about a company you may uh, or a manufacturing situation you may identify entity types called machine product uh, raw material etc etc those would be the entity types we are dealing with okay so in an entity relationship diagram entity means entity types we're not really concerned about instances although i might give examples of instances and how they play a role okay so now we've already seen how to draw the entity for a course let's take another example this is your turn so we are given the table parts what would the entity type for this table look like i would suggest at this point stop the video go back or look at your notes and take a look at the previous example and along those lines create the corresponding entity for the parts table as i have always stressed it's a very good idea for you to do this right now otherwise you will actually end up wasting time as you go through the entire lecture you think you're understanding it but your lack of understanding or small problems or conceptual issues will never come to the fore unless you put pen to paper and try to do something so i strongly recommend that you pause the video draw the corresponding entity for this and then of course you can compare it with my solution as i go forward right and i also don't think it's a good idea for you to take a look at my handout and then just copy what is in the handout because then again you're not learning right at this point you should make an effort to do this completely on your own if you get it wrong that's fine that's part of learning okay so I assume this is what your entity looked like. Okay, of course, the description does not tell us which attributes are optional and which attributes are required. The only thing we know, of course, is that part number being the primary key is not optional. That has to be required. That's the primary key. Everything else I just said, make your own assumptions regarding required and optional attributes. Okay, so this is what I came up with, that a part number is a key. Every part requires a part number and weight and color and city are optional. You might have done something different, that doesn't matter. But uh, so long as you got this rectangle with the name part and with these five attributes, then you're doing pretty fine. But for every attribute, you should definitely have put something. Part numbers you should definitely have identified as the key. And for the remaining ones, you should have put optional or required depending on your choice. 
Okay, so I assume you did that and you get an idea of the connection between tables and entities. Okay, now here what we are doing is we are looking at the table and then drawing the entity. But in the real world, you will first talk to people, analyze the business situation, identify the entities, and only then the tables would be created. Okay, so I'm just showing you uh, how it all is going to come out in the end. Another example, in one of our examples, we had a table for instructors and the corresponding entity is going to look like this. This table had uh, instructor ID was the primary key. First name, last name are attributes. I just assumed that they are required attributes and I've assumed that date of birth is a optional attribute. Okay, so entity types coming to the definition of it, it's a category of things about which an organization wants to store data. Okay, it represents a category. It represents a concept. An entity type is very different as we've already talked about than an entity instance. Okay, so it represents a category. That's very important. And of course, another very important thing is when you say something is an entity type, then obviously you should be able to say that this has the potential to have instances. For example, I said course is an entity type. What are the instances of that entity type? Lots of different courses. Our course is an example, is an instance of course, and so on. The university offers so many courses, each of them is an instance of this abstract concept called entity type or the category called entity type, and each course is an instance of that entity type. So if you say something is an entity type, then it should be capable of having instances. If not, it's not an entity type. And we'll see examples of that shortly. An entity type always has attributes. At the very least, it'll have a primary key as an attribute. Most of the time, it'll have other attributes. Okay, so if something doesn't have attributes, then it cannot be an entity type. Okay, so here's an example. Instructor is the entity type. Here's the entity table, and each of these rows represents an, in, an, in, an entity instance, an instance of instructor, right? Row one represents the instructor whose name is Darius Bookman. Row two represents the instructor whose name is Carrie McCament or whatever. Okay, so that's the connection between entity types and entity instances. Type is the concept. We're saying, okay, there's this thing called instructor, and every instructor has an ID, first name, last name, and possibly a date of birth. That's all. We're not talking about any specific instructor. We are talking about something that is common to all instructors. All instructors have these properties. They may take on specific values for each of the attributes as you're seeing here. Okay, that's the distinction between an entity type and an entity instance. Okay, clearly each instance has its own value for each of the attributes. Entity types, as I've already pointed out, are always named with singular noun. This is very important. If you don't get this, then you really don't get the concept of entity, right? You can't say borrowing is an entity or, uh, you know, purchases somebody, A buys a product, buys is not an entity because that's a verb, it's not a noun. Okay, so entity types are always named with singular nouns because it represents the name of a category. It's not a collection of things. It's the name of a category, right? So it's not the collection of customers. That may be the table, but that's not the entity type. The entity type is customer, vendor, instructor, course, section. Each of them is a singular noun. It could be a noun phrase. Sometimes it's a noun phrase but never a verb, okay? So from what we've already seen, entity type is a category, entity type is a singular noun, every entity type has attributes, and every entity type usually has instances, okay? So this is what defines an entity type. Let's do some examples. I'm going to sh say show some things here. For each of those things, you think about whether it represents an entity type or an entity instance. Okay, you have to apply these rules that I've spoken about. It's a noun, a singular noun, it's a category, it has attributes and it could potentially have instances. Those are the properties or those are the ca characteristics that it should have 
in order to be an entity type. Custom. Is this an entity type? Is this a category? Yes. Can it have instances? Yes. Customer A, customer B, customer C, they'll all be instances of customer. Can it have attributes? Yes. Customer can have an ID, a name, an address, a telephone number. All of these will be attributes of customer. Yes, it can have uh, this thing. So it satisfies all of the properties that we spoke about and therefore customer could potentially be an entity type. Vendor. Can it be an entity type? Of course, it's just like customer. It satisfies all the properties. Okay, it's a category. Can have instances vendor A, vendor B, vendor C. It has attributes. Again, you know, vendor ID, vendor name, vendor address, everything's just like customer. And therefore, it can also be an entity type. It has attributes. We've seen that. Seton Hall University. Is this an entity type? Think about it for yourself. Is, does this represent a category? No, it doesn't represent a category. This represents a specific university. The general category may be university or educational institution or Catholic organization, right? That's the category. But Seton Hall University is an instance of those categories. Okay, and therefore by itself, it's not a category. And therefore, it cannot be an entity type. This is an entity instance. Okay, now some people when I say this, they say, well, Seton Hall University is the category. They say that it's wrong. They say Seton Hall University has College of Arts and Sciences, Business School, Law School, School of Nursing. Aren't those instances of Seton Hall University? No, those are not instances of Seton Hall University. Is the Business School an instance of Seton Hall University? No. It's a part of Seton Hall University. If you take the business school alone, it's not a Seton Hall University. It's the Seton Hall University's business school. It's a component. It's not the whole. Okay, the whole is what we call a Seton Hall University, the combination of all of these things that we spoke about. And therefore, this does not represent a category. This is an entity instance. It cannot have instances of its own person. Can this be an entity type? Yes, it's a category. Person is a category and the instances will be you, me, uh, you know, Jack and John and all these people are instances of this entity type called person. Attribute? Sure. Person ID, social security number perhaps, name, uh, you know, height, weight, age, everything. All of those are attributes of person. Has instances, is a category, has attributes, uh, everything. So this is clearly an entity type. How about person with this social security number, a particular person? Okay, that's not an entity type. That is an entity instance. In fact, it's an instance of the entity type called person. Okay, so this is clearly not an entity type. It's just an instance. Okay, so that's. So entity type is a category. It's a singular noun, has attributes, usually has instances. Okay, now let's start getting into how we draw entity relationship diagrams.